Um, thank you everyone for coming on behalf of Bruce and I guess myself. Um, good to see everyone. Um, my name is Ron Otaviano. For those who don't know me, and I was a really close friend of Bobby's. I live on this block and um, Bobby lived just up the street and over the last many decades, we've spent a lot of time together. Um, I miss it terribly, and I will launch into um, my remembrance of Bobby. Um, Bobby Kelly was that rare person who everyone seemed to like straight away. His charm shined through his humor. He had a way of tempering irreverence with puckish charm. He expressed opinions gently, and he was, above all, funny. Smart and funny. Very funny. Sneaky funny. <laughs> and he was perversely witty, like Oscar Wilde, if Wilde had grown up in a Brooklyn housing project. <laughs> My friendship with Bobby was the longest one I've ever had. I met him when I was 24. That was 39 years ago before even the onset of the decrepitude you see before you. <laughs> I was fairly new to New York and studying filmmaking at NYU. Mike Topp, whom I knew from Rhode Island, had told me that I could get a part-time job at a place called CCI, just up Broadway a few blocks. It was a good tip. Thanks, Mike. Bobby, then a senior copy editor, I think, said hello to me as I passed his desk to get to the boss, the copy chief. Bobby looked like John Hurt to me, I remember. I was nervous, but the chief, Sal Alaco, was a roly-poly, flamboyant man who reminded me of a jovial Victor Blona. His flirty interview took the pressure off. I was hired 20 minutes later. <laughs> we had mostly discussed the beauty of Italy and the legend of Betty Davis. <laughs> and speaking of Victor Buono, his work area had stills of whatever happened to Baby Jane. <laughs> With those quotes like, but you are Blanche. <laughs> Pictures of Davis and Crawford. The place dripped gayness. <laughs> Sal was a doyenne at the Museum of Queers. I spoke to Bobby right after. I was probably smiling. He said, I take it you were hired because you're young and you have a penis. <laughs> <laughs> a few months after I started at CCI, some network aired Scared Straight, that 1970s documentary with hardened inmates verbally abusing wayward juveniles. The next day, the office buzzed about the episode, how effective the scaring might be, how shocking the piece was, at least for TV in 1985. Bobby looked blasé. He said, and I'm censoring, I didn't get it. I saw this handsome young black man yelling at a skinny white kid. If I tell you to get on your knees and suck my blank, then you suck my blank, else I fuck you up, bitch. And Bobby said, and I thought, what's the catch? <laughs> <laughs> I had recently arrived in Providence, and I found this the height of sophistication. <laughs> I think two things occurred to me then. One, this guy is stone funny. Two, I want him to be my friend. I'm very glad Bobby felt the same way. Over the next decades, much of my lifetime really, Bobby and I hung out together, ate together, worked together, sometimes often, sometimes not. Our conversation never lagged, and I don't remember one when we didn't laugh, including in Lenox Hill Hospital the day before he died. Gallo's humor was another specialty of his. At a recidivist turn at CCI around 2017, a rather stiff copy editor, whom I will call Jane Doe, <laughs> objected to Bobby bringing Jasper, his and Bruce's dog, to the office on summer weekends. Everyone else loved Jasper. 
we were withering behind Jane's back. A couple of years ago, that poor woman died of cancer. Bobby said this, Jasper won, Jane zero. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bobby and I found each other interesting. Anyway, I found him interesting, and when he was interested or amused by me, it felt very good. We shared a love of old movies and dropped lines from them in our conversations. We liked cable TV, true crime, and learning channel shows about hoarders and the morbidly obese. <laughs> he did a funny impression of Dr. Henry Lee, a blood spatter analyst who showed up often on the show Forensic Files. Blood test story. Broad tech story. That was blood tell story in Bobby's um, retrograde Chinese accent. <laughs> we both liked art and Bobby came to my shows, though he hated going out like that even more than I did. I loved his embroidery and his drawing style. He liked that I called him a deep miniaturist. We had the same thoughts about coworkers and friends. We loved gardening. In the mid-1990s, Bobby got me a job at Scholastic where I ended up being his boss and where he was the copy chief. We walked from the West Village to the East Village and back pretty much every day for a few years. To this day, if I walk down West 9th Street, between 5th and 6th, I think of Bobby. We love the elegant townhouses and the flowers on that block. We sized up the window boxes and street plantings all over mm -hmm. downtown. We spotted licks we used. We ordered from catalogs together. We loved Petunia and Tegrafolia and Ivy Geranium. We dismissed Dusty Miller and made a glossy or variegated pasta. Over the years, we carried on gardening talk and bought plants together at the Union Square Green Market. I loved when he would call a plant, a plant I found purdy. That's the word he used, purdy, purdy. And added it to his backyard garden. Bobby was there the day my wife Lee's brought home a puppy. He helped me, he helped talk me, talk me into keeping her. We named her Sophie, but Bobby always called her Duchess. He'd say it with ridiculously exaggerated love. He loved dogs, and I remember dog walks we did together. Him calling their, their dog Cash a bit dim. <laughs> we babysat each other's pets, we had each other's keys. He and Bruce were at my wedding, which, including our families, had just 25 or 30 guests in a garden of a French bistro in Shelton. They stopped by after our son Luca was born. Bobby said our baby had legs like divine. <laughs> we shared a love of movies, good and bad. He hipped me to some of them, like The Letter, The Girl Can't Help It, an attack of the 50-foot woman, starring his beloved and forgotten Yvette Vickers. He infected me with this bit of Richard Burton from Virginia Woolf, you make me puke. <laughs> <laughs> he said that with such contempt and he used it so often. Like so many things. A favorite impression of his was, you know, for me was his, the way he summed up this woman, Camille, who was this stock, stocky trafficking woman at Scholastic. She was an Italian-American out of Damon Runyon, a, like a butch Brooklyn lesbian who used an oddly frenzy word one time about a coworker, and Bobby never forgot it, and he did the imitation. That fucking guy is morose. <laughs> 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 this is another reason Bobby was really unique. He could wield a cutting or obscene wit and never seem bitter or ugly. I don't know anyone else like that. I never met anyone else like that. He was a master of picaresque with a sharp memory of the people in his life, whether family or passing figures. He recalled growing up a fay boy in Brooklyn, housing project, by aping a macho teenager, dressing him down. You got feminine ways, Jack. 
<laughs> he took knocks like that. He kept them. In the late 1960s, Bobby moved in briefly with his grandmother, who had a small two-bedroom apartment on Christopher Street. She would live on in his impressions, probably rolling over in a grave now that I think of it. But once when I showed him a plant in our apartment, he spat out dust collectors, <laughs> which was how Grandma Kelly once bemoaned the existence of her own house plants. <laughs> he remembered her later waxing nostalgic about the changes to Christopher Street over the years. The fairies used to look out for you. In an email to me, he referred to his grandmother as a woman of towering ignorance. <laughs> to set up a racist remark, he recalled her making about Sam Davis Jr. Imagine waking up with that black head next to you. <laughs> Perversity was a specialty of his. Bobby loved to cast me as a couple with a husband or an adult ex-junkie, my wife as a cheat or gold digger, my mother as a fall-down drunk. I remember recounting to him a slight I felt or a conflict I had. Bobby might impishly take the opposing side. He might defend the offender and call me a little man, a petty man. <laughs> I'd belittle his polio shoulder, his age, his love of the movie, they shoot horses, don't they? Mm. All of this delighted and distracted me when he felt low about growing old, about failing health. I quoted a Joan Crawford line from, Mas from Mannequin. You're not so old now. That is, not very. <laughs> he liked that. <laughs> I've gone on and on about how I cherish Bobby's sense of humor, but I want to acknowledge that our friendship went deeper. He lent me money when I needed it, sometimes for questionable reasons. He cheered me up when I had cancer. He said the right thing when I lost people I love. He knew what it was to go through shit. We shared redemption from addiction. We loved our Catholic iconography. I loved him. I miss him. Bobby was original. He was soulful. He is irreplaceable. His death is a big loss for the city I see through my eyes. And I think I partly see it through his. And I want to leave you with this little email Bobby sent me last year. Like this just, you know, this shit just went on over the years, like this throwaway stuff that was like, you know, great. Um, just great, it was just so funny. Um, Bobby was replying to um, a copy edit job that I wanted him to do for my little company. Um, because the various subjects were not at all his thing, I told him that he needed to worry only about the words. I laid out the courses and the grade levels, and he commented on each. Math, grade three, grade level too high. <laughs> Physics, high school, don't know what that is. <laughs> Environmental systems, high school. Bobby bullfaced the mental in environmental <laughs> world. Nothing mental. <laughs> and finally, statistics, high school. Bobby, if it's about cops, okay. <laughs> that is Bobby. <laughs> I don't write, although I'm a writer, um, I'm just going to speak. Um, it's, I, you know, I do think it's an unusual memorial that already has had so much laughter, and that's because a lot of people said Bobby really was the funniest person they knew, and it was so impromptu. It wasn't he could write and it'd be hilarious, but it was about being with him and just in the moment, the off the cuff. It wasn't even intended to be a joke. He was just funny. <laughs> he just said funny things. 
And it was really dangerous because when you were with him, at times you would try to copy him and you would try to do the same thing. And it would just land like on lead. <laughs> because he could get away with it because he was so sweet. I mean, he was, he had this really filthy sense of humor. <laughs> but with this core sweetness that you could just see instantly and you knew that he didn't mean anything he had not an ounce of bitchiness it was a really funny gay guy but there was no bitch there <laughs> so it was just it was a pleasure to be with him but i'm not going to try to be funny um but i do want to i want to share a little of his biography just because it's an amazing story and i do think he was proud of it although he would never say that because in his vocabulary. Um, so he, his mom was a French war bride, and they got married, and she didn't speak almost any English, so it was a pretty, um, there were a lot of surprises. His dad was a rather cold man. They ended up coming here. They lived in post-war housing, and they were friends. Bobby broke with Frankie, and at four, Bobby gets polio. He remembers being an iron lung, and he doesn't remember if that's true memory or not. He knows he was in the hospital and there were people in iron lungs, but he often improved things. And that, that memory got improved to him being four years old in an iron lung, <laughs> clinging on to life. And he did pretty well. He, with the polio, he had a little bit of impairment on his shoulder. Um, he could only get that far. He couldn't get up this high. But that's about it. So as polio goes, he did really well. <laughs> then 10 years later, his dad dies when the twins are 14, at which point his mom is in and out of institutions. So basically, Bobby and Frank are living alone in Brooklyn. They go once a week to Staten Island to get the, the severance check or the check that was owed. <coughs> and they go home and the local family, including Grandma on Christopher Street, expected these 14-year-old boys to do just fine, mm. which Frankie responded by almost instantly dropping out of school, becoming a gambler, and uh, drinking a whole lot. <laughs> so Bobby managed to get through. He got through high school and got into Cooper Union, mm -hmm. which is amazing. He got to Cooper Union, realized that he sounded kind of like an idiot, <laughs> and trained himself out of his Brooklyn accent. <laughs> he would not do it for me. I begged <laughs> <laughs> And early on when we were dating, he would slip into it a little bit. He hated doing it. He just, it was a, he had put that behind him and he didn't want to do it, but he really, he trained himself out of it. And that was where, that was his origin story. And all I could think of Whenever I think of a story is Thelma Ritter as Birdie in All About Eve. What a story. Everything but the bloodhound snapping at a rear end. <laughs> and that's what Bobby had behind him. And he went so far and so close to so many people. We met uh, a couple, a year before Ron, um, my first week in New York. After college, uh, my first job was I had the same interview with Sal. Got the job. And Bobby was already a copy editor there. And we spent a while um, flirting with each other. We were an odd match. I was a very naive boy from Ohio who was pretty much modeling my life on Patty too. <laughs> and so I thought that you dated. I thought that everybody goes on a series of dates and then you go to first base. <laughs> Whereas Bobby was, had gone through New York in the 70s and lived really near the piers and there was not a lot of dating going on. <laughs> um, but somehow he read my signals pretty clearly and we had a lovely about two month courtship. He knew I liked corn muffins. And so he bought me a corn muffin every day from the, the stand. And that courtship ended up lasting 38 years. Um, he was 
older, but anyone who saw him back then, he was the youngest 37 <coughs> you ever saw. He didn't seem older. He hung up. He met all of the Hamilton people, many of whom are here, and he fit in with college, recent college graduates just perfectly. He was easy with any group. But we were essentially, you know, we had such different backgrounds. We were, you know, I was a suburban kid. Doc, my dad was a doctor. But we really got along under the surface, just the core connection. We were comfortable with each other. Um, uh, many of you know that my, my dad and my husband died in the same year of the same thing. They both had heart attacks in the hospital after my dad after two nights, Bobby after three. And it's just a weird thing. It doesn't make it hard, better or easier or harder. It's just weird. And they couldn't be more different. But I'm very, very proud that they came to really appreciate each other. Bobby came to rely on my dad like my whole family did. He, dad was a psychiatrist, but also very, very helpful with any medical problem. The first thing he did was call up dad. And Bobby did the same thing. He got really used to that. And then dad really got to respect and love Bobby to the point that when it finally became legal for us to get married, we weren't going to make a big deal of it. We always thought, oh, let's see how I'll get married. Um, we'll grab, we'll have a friend or two. And my dad was really disappointed that he wasn't going to be there. So we said, okay, fine. We arranged our wedding to be when dad was coming to visit. And he was one of two witnesses. Gail was the witness for Bobby. He had been at her city hall wedding with Artie several years before that. And it was just the four of us. So I'm very proud and very happy that my dad and Bobby did come together as different as they were. Um, that sweetness was never more obvious than when Bobby was around animals. He just, he loved our dogs, any dog, his birds, which I lived with. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he just, he really adored all animals and connected with them and felt for them. He became a gardener in Hastings. Oh, so we snapped on the city after three years because of the last sound situation in the bar next door that wasn't popular when we moved in and then became very popular. Anyway, we moved to Hastings and had a great three years there, and Bobby took over the garden, became a gardener, and his condition of coming back, I wanted to come back to the city because I felt uh, isolated from the city. Bobby was still working at the time. He wanted some sort of terrace where he could, either a fire escape or a pet. Anyway, we ended up with a nice patio and that because of him, um, which I hope that many of you will come back and see after this. We're going to gather there. And, I've been taking care of it <coughs> since he's gone, and I've, it's been a really nice way to keep him with, uh, with me. Um, technology was never his friend, uh, almost any sort. One of his very first jobs early on was map cutting. He was terrible at it. He was, he was a good artist. He was, did not have a steady hand, uh, even young. He did not have got worse. Um, but he was fascinated by the internet. And he was an early internet troll. <laughs> <laughs> he really liked, and this isn't like AOL days, but even so on Facebook, he liked the anonymous posts. And he liked that, you know, he could use his humor. And all, the only one I'm going to mention, he really started to stalk a group called Christian Bow Hunters, <laughs> <laughs> which is a real thing, apparently. If you're Christian and hunt with a bow, you need a group to belong to. And there is one. And Bob found them, and he relentlessly posted on their chat. Just relentlessly. And including the shortest and favorite of both of us was, what would Jesus shoot? <laughs> he 
did, I think, cause that chat board to close. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, they just decided it wasn't worth it. And they shut it down. Maybe you had to be a member, but you should no longer get there. Um, thank you. I am going to come back in a little bit and talk a little bit more about him and his movies. But the only other thing I want to mention, because it's true, and I know a lot of us would think it is, he was just so damn cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Stone is next. No, Rob. This is my brother, Rob. staying with Bruce and Bobby for, for various trips over the years. I'm a, a frugal academic at Indiana University, so um, it was always a godsend when Bruce and Bobby uh, welcomed me uh, to their place. I took them up on it any number of times, and um, part of the, the, the benefit of staying with them is just to see what their everyday life was like. And I, I love the atmosphere there at their apartment. Um, I love the meticulous way that uh, Bobby would fold and refold the, in, the New York Times in various ways. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was incredible to me. I love the way that he would leave um, books, history books, um, uh, books about serial murders oftentimes. Um, uh, he had so many reading things that he, he loved. Um, I, I loved how he loved uh, his pet birds that nobody else seemed, <laughs> seemed to be able to love. Um, I, I just loved the, the, the daily routine of seeing uh, uh, Bobby curl up with uh, a dog or Bruce or, or both of them <laughs> oftentimes. Um, I remember his fluency with, with language. Um, amazing to see his, his word crafting ability, um, his wit, um, wit that you would um, oftentimes have to look at very carefully in order to know that there was wit there or it would just at least pass me by. Um, I, I, I remember um, once uh, Bruce uh, being very full of proud pride when uh, Child Magazine um, took one of Bobby's uh, taglines for their, the, the cover of their issue, and it was an issue for um, uh, single parents uh, and the advice that the magazine <coughs> wanted to give to these single parents. But the magazine wanted to um, uh, target, get the, the unmarried parents so they would buy the magazine but they didn't want to put off their more mainstream readership. And so Bobby came up with, I thought was the, the perfect phrase, which was what every single parent needs to know. <laughs> really, and that was very, very typical of it, the, the cleverness. I, I admire tremendously the beautiful artworks that he made, uh, all, of course, the, the boxes that many of us know, but also uh, the, the piece that he made um, for, for our wedding. Actually, Bruce and Bobby both made pieces for our wedding out of clay. And Bruce's was um, a, a two-headed fish that was kind of Muppet-like and very whimsical. And I thought captured very well the sort of closeness and intimacy of, of a romantic relationship. And Bobby's was completely different. It was this quadruped, uh, <laughs> this duck-billed, uh, furrow, uh, you know, furrow uh, brows, um, uh, very uh, brawny haunch. Um, and, and to me, it was sort of representing this other side of love, which was you know, more full of anguish, but also ferocity. And, and that was also Bobby. Um, you know, um, I, I guess I remember most this, just this feeling of peace and love 
and you know mutual respect and care that that Bruce and Bobby shaped together. And from what I saw, Bobby never had an agenda, you know, something that he was looking to get out of somebody else, um, something that he was trying to convince somebody of. He just let people be. He might, uh, behind their backs, he might say something. But, <laughs> but he never, in front of them, you know, he, he, he let them be. And so he was always, to me, you know, extremely gentle and, and witty and, and but mostly companionable. He was a great companion. And so he brought, you know, this atmosphere of, of warmth and generosity and harmony to the, the apartment that I stayed in so many times. And I always love him for that. Um, and so um, the, the next speaker is going to be Stona, which is uh, the husband of Anne, who is the brother of Bruce. <laughs> so, as Rob said, I'm uh, Bobby's brother in law by marriage, and it was a privilege. And I appreciate the chance to, to meet a lot of you that I heard uh, over the years, uh, but really only from meeting today. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you more uh, with Bruce. So when we lose someone close to us, uh, what we remember most isn't what they said, uh, and it's how they made us feel when we were with them. And that's a well-worn truism because in a way, it's true. And uh, I'm passing it along today because a lot of us here today are in the word business, you know, in one way or another. A lot of writers, like Bobby was certainly one of the more fluent writers and speakers that I've met. Um, so it's easy for us to focus on the conversations and the words we shared with Bobby and the things he said or they wrote um, because he was brilliant. As everybody's pointed out, he was hilarious. Uh, he was world-wise, he was sharp-witted, he could be perverse. <laughs> and uh, like all of us here, I shared a lot of words with Bobby over the years. Uh, but mainly, you know, I remember the way he made me feel. And he made me feel lucky. Uh, lucky to know him, lucky to have had the opportunity to be part of his life. Uh, lucky to spend time with him. Uh, lucky to share the deep love that Bobby and Bruce shared. And I also felt lucky that his legendarily sharp wit was generally not focused on me, but on me. Nothing with that, and I would help him with that. <laughs> so when we remember Bobby, take a moment and remember the singular way he made you feel, how his spirit resonated and enlivened yours this afternoon, tomorrow, and forever. It's not enough, of course, but it's powerful and it's real. And it's more than words. Thank you. PhD candidate, academic genius, and also my daughter, Claire Lynch. <laughs> so I'm one of Bobby's nieces, um, which is a special, strange, and singular way to know somebody only a few times a year, um, but every year, somebody to look forward to, never get too much of, and never quite enough of. Um, as I'm sure you can all imagine, Bobby in the role of an uncle is a very cool uncle. <laughs> Always appearing like a treat in the middle of a family gathering or a holiday. He was levity, a break, a comrade in the struggle to sit through a long dinner. <laughs> I think there are certain adults you encounter when you're a kid that make you say, 
whoa, okay, I get it, that's how to be, that's how to get older and stay cool. Um, Avi has always been tucked firmly in my head as this figure of a way to be, a real role model, someone that really stood out among the rest. Um, and to be a kid, to encounter an adult like Bobby, bleach haired, elusive, <laughs> handed, and honest, brilliant, and unserious, unwavering, hilarious, discerning, tucked among all the other adults, felt like this huge good secret. It uh, mm -hmm. made the world feel more complicated and interesting than others might have known. Because of this unparalleled presence he was and the grace with which he was just totally himself, um, he taught me a lot of uncommon lessons, I think, that really hit, really stuck with me about how one could interact with the world. He taught me first uh, that things were all ultimately pretty funny and maybe dismissible, and it was important to look at them carefully because of this, to watch the world like a movie, I knew I could always look at him and ask him what he was thinking, and he'd offer the perfect insight on the dynamics of the day, it would cut to the core of a situation with just like a single sentence. Um, he was a punctuation, using his words sparingly and thoughtfully in a way that reduced down all the noise of a day or a holiday or the world into the essence of things. Um, and in this way, hearing his insights and getting to see the world through his eyes was something that felt like it cleaned out clutter or overwhelm um, and made things really simple. Watching him be with animals, especially his birds, he taught me about tenderness, about a gentle way of touching the world, um, another reason to be quiet, the importance of gentle and slow observation and how to appreciate strange beauty. In his art, his boxes especially, uh, he taught me that it was possible to craft worlds for yourself that you could make whatever you wanted by pulling things together into strange new configurations, that you could find in a pile of objects, a pile of trash, a wonderful little scene if you were thoughtful, careful, lovingly curatorial, and unforgivingly creative. Having Bobby as an uncle also meant that I only ever saw him with Bruce. <laughs> um, knowing him as half of the signature B&B &B on birthday cards, <laughs> Uh, because of this, his presence will always be affiliated with love for me. His life to me is a lot about, his life as a love, as loved and loving. Um, and this taught me really exciting things about what partnership can make a person into, into half of a signature, into a couple that cohered, into a formidable and luminous presence in our family. Um, I'll always feel endlessly grateful to you that you brought him into our family and our life um, and let me learn all these things from him and that you shared with us this wonderful thing that you guys had together, um, this wonderful person that he was. Thank you. Don't sound like Ralph Bandon, you know, hum, 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 hum. But um, I uh, met Bobby, like most of you, at CCI. And uh, we weren't really friends uh, at CCI, we were more like acquaintances. But I do remember him giving me uh, one time to read an imaginary review of a Lennon Sisters reunion concert <laughs> in which Janet Lennon threw up on the conductor. At the end. And I was laughing so hard that I actually, my stomach cramped. Um, later on, we found ourselves at Scholastic. And there, we kind of bonded. We found that we had this great love for, as Ron said, old movies, obscure movie lines, the usual gay movie icons, Betty and Liz, uh, Marilyn and Joan, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, Bobby did a mean Catherine Hepburn uh, imitation. I can duplicate it here, but when I say mean, I mean mean. <laughs> um, I know what I mean. Um, so we would delight in throwing out lines from these obscure films, and some well-known films, particularly if it fit in the situation in which we found ourselves. I want to give you an example. Um, I was at McGraw Hill, so was he. And uh, he comes over to my desk one day, or my cubicle, and he's got a piece of paper in his hand. And I can tell he's pissed, 
And before I can say anything, uh, he says, listen to this. <laughs> and it was a memo that somebody had written, and I guess there were several copies at uh, the printer. And um, it was criticizing a couple of divisions in the department, and one of them being copy editing, which he wasn't the head of copy editing, but he was a member of the copy editing team. And um, so he was you know, pissed, and he starts reading it, and then he suddenly stopped. And I looked at him, and I said, is that the end? And he goes, he takes the memo, and he goes, no. He goes, it gets better. <laughs> Which is, of course, Benny Davis from All About You. <laughs> well, I started laughing. And I could see the glimmer of a smile you know, on his face. He thought of this, and it was so appropriate. Um, so I'm laughing, and I can see, you know, he's smiling a bit, but he's still pissed. And then he finally finishes. And I came up with a line from, I don't know, gentlemen prefer blondes or something. <laughs> And we started going back and forth and back and forth. We finally concluded with his favorite line from the Ten Commandments, you've been drinking honey wine. <laughs> Neither of us knew what that meant. I don't remember how it fit into the conversation. But anyway, it was Ann Baxter to Judith Anderson. Um, so through all of this, I'm sitting across from Francis Story, another editor. And she's listening to this, of course. And, um, I can see her go like this, with this expression on her face that read, what in hell are you two talking about? You know? um, I just want to say one last thing. Um, we used to try and trip, trip each other up with you know, lines from obscure films or whatever. And one Saturday morning, he sends me an email. And he says, you're never going to guess this one. And the line was, um, Daddy? I'm Kelly Williams, the movie star now. And I said, well, that's easy. It's from the sex symbol, a 1973 ABC TV movie of the week starring Connie Stevens as Kelly Williams, a Marilyn Monroe bar, with Shelley Winters as a sob sister, while Kelly Williams was this pause, like I didn't hear from him for like half an hour. Then he comes back and he says, you know, when we go, a whole category of completely useless Hollywood knowledge can go with us. <laughs> All I can say is, um, until we meet again, Bobby, I will carry the torch for <laughs> both of us. Thank you. for 40 years. We worked together at four different companies, and if we weren't working together, we'd make sure and have lunch. In the 90s, we'd go to Grand Central Station and have $20 cheeseburgers at this place called Tropicana, very fancy. <laughs> years later, Bobby and I would eat lunch either at Trax in Penn Station or else the Holiday Diner on 6th Avenue. Kate Steinberg would join us quite often. What I most remember about these lunches was that afterwards my face would hurt from laughing. I laughed so much my face would really hurt. There were many sides to Bobby. There was schmaltzy Bobby, like in this email he sent me about uh, the infamous Sal Alapa who's harassing everyone. <laughs> Sal asked me to come in for my interview when I was like 22. He told me to come in at 6.30 on Friday night and to sit on his desk. <laughs> And then he just told me about the boy prostitutes he patronized and how he was such a nice guy, they gave it to him for free. <laughs> I got the job. <laughs> um, so he, I wanted to read this email he sent me. He's talking about Sal, and uh, he was concerned about my predatory boss. He's like, Mike, it's been almost four decades we've known each other. I was feeling nostalgic about it this morning. I remember how mad I was when you started CCI and Sal would make his raunchy, suggestive fag remarks. I was all, Jesus Christ, leave the guy alone. He just started here and doesn't need this awkward homo shit. But it turned out you weren't phased by it. Then there was funny Bobby. He's always wisecracking. Here's another email he sent me. It's a personal ad he wrote. 
Gay white male, senior twink, 68. <laughs> Average endowment, intermittent functionality. <laughs> nice pancake butt. <laughs> Enjoy social, social security kink. Do not resuscitate scenes. <laughs> and hot end of life fantasy. <laughs> and Miss Bobby, that's what I want to Child magazine um, starting in 2000. And I'm actually reading a message from our editor in chief, Miriam, who couldn't be here. And um, I'm, I'm going to add some words of my own at the end. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be at today's memorial service, and I appreciate that Kara has agreed to share a few words for me. I know Bobby from our days at Child magazine. We worked together from 2000 to 2007. Child was a parenting magazine. It was about family, but the child staff itself was a family. There was a bond between us, a creative spirit, compassion, caring, and lots of fun times. Bobby was a beloved member of our family. You can probably imagine exactly what kind of family member Bobby was. He was the relative who stood back when we were gathered together, kind of quiet, but always had the witty comment that sent us all rolling in laughter. Bobby was the second hire I made when I became editor-in-chief of Child Magazine. I first hired Andrea Barbalik, and when I told her I needed a copy editor, she said she knew the perfect person, Bobby Kelly. I am forever grateful that Andrea recommended Bobby. Most copy editors just check punctuation and grammar, adding a comma here and a period there. Bobby certainly did that, but he was also very thoughtful. He cared about the content. If he raised a question, I paid attention. He never piped up to show off. He just wanted to make the articles shine. His instincts and judgment and attention to detail were 100% trustworthy. He was a family member you can rely on. Now, I don't want to make Bobby sound totally angelic. I'm sure everyone here knows that Bobby had the most dry, droll sense of humor. He loved nothing more than to be insulting. We waited in suspense as birthday cards to staff circulated to see what incredibly insulting <laughs> he would write, cutting the birthday honoree down to size, and he didn't discriminate. I may have been editor-in-chief, but he was perfectly happy to insult me, which I loved. And so this is the thing. You could love Bobby's insults because he had a great heart. How ironic that he died of a heart attack. Bobby had such a beautiful heart. Talking about hearts, it makes me, I have to think about the funny thing I'm going to tell you in a second. <laughs> Talking about hearts, it makes me happy that Bobby had such a long and loving relationship with Bruce. I love that he loved and was loved. Bobby, you were very special. I hope you know how much we all loved you. Um, so, in going back through my, I stopped working at Child in 2003, um, but we kept in touch through email and, and lunches and dinners over the years. And um, I, just like all of you, I have all these emails, and I'm, I am like rationing them because they're so, they're so funny. Um, but through the pandemic, we didn't keep in touch that much, and I can't believe I'm going to announce this to a group of people, but I gained a shitload of weight during the pandemic. <laughs> And then I lost it, and I wrote to him and just filled him in on what was going on, and I said, I, I lost 50 pounds. And he wrote back, wow, that's really impressive. A 50-pound weight loss is really impressive. Then again, so is a 50-pound weight gain. Yeah, I have, I, I'm realizing over these past several months how many little things I can connect back to him. When you said technology wasn't his friend, I'm pretty sure he told me that he didn't want to get a cell phone because then the terrorists would have won. <laughs> um, I think Andrea Barbalik, who's going to speak next, will, um, I think she may 
name some of those, uh, she might describe some of those birthday card greetings. I wasn't going to say them because of, I don't know you all, but after hearing the things you're saying you said, I know I could have shared them. <laughs> Thank you. I love Bobby. I love seeing um, everybody here for him. And this, this is like one home run after another. You have all said the most incredible things. Thank you. Bobby at the Scholastic headquarters in Soho in the summer of 1996. Like so many of you here, um, worked with Bobby at Scholastic. I had just uh, started a job as uh, the executive editor in the early childhood division, and one day I saw him saunter, and it definitely was a saunter, past my office, long haired and cool looking. I introduced myself to him, and that was that. A the start of a professional collaboration that became a treasured friendship. Professionally, he was the best copy editor I'd ever worked with. And with apologies to any other copy editors I worked with who are here today. <laughs> he was brilliant, exacting, yet flexible, with a perfect ear for language. He could read my mind, it seemed. We never disagreed. He was always right, and he made everything we did better. He made me better. Personally, there was no one else like him. His combination of uh, intelligence, talent, warmth, and wit caused me to refer to him as My beloved BK. Starting at Scholastic and continuing when I suggested we bring him to Child Magazine, where I had taken a job four years later. Thank goodness he said yes. I'm not the only one grateful for that, as Miriam, Kara, and our many colleagues who quickly grew fond of him can attest. We did everything on paper then, of course. Bobby made his copy changes and his sarcastic comments in green colored pencil in his easily identifiable left-handed script, <laughs> often with intricate <coughs> drawings in the margins. If there was an opportunity to poke fun at an unwieldy sentence, an inane quote, or an editor, he didn't hesitate. <laughs> We had a tradition of circulating birthday cards to staff members, signed by everyone, as you've just learned. <laughs> Other people would write, happy birthday, and many more. <laughs> or wishing a wonderful person a wonderful day. Bobby, however, would write to our accounts payable manager, for example. <laughs> Dear Crystal, buy yourself something nice with all the money you've been embezzling. <laughs> Love Bobby. <laughs> Thank you, Kara, for remembering that heartfelt inscription. <clears throat> there really was no reason for anyone else to sign a card, honestly, because all that anyone really cared about was what Bobby wrote. <laughs> Our staff also came up with joke headlines, and one of Bobby's best to go with a story about Rabbi Shmuley Botea, an expert on relationships, marriage, and sex, was rowdy and unruly with Rabbi Shmuley. <laughs> uh, thank you to Emily, who isn't here today, for remembering that. Uh, the remarkable fact that people can recall what he said word for word 20 years ago is an indication of the impact that he had. Some of the other comments our child colleagues have shared about Bobby recently. 
Bobby was a genius copy editor, and with his quiet, deadpan humor, he kept us laughing and eagerly awaiting the dry quips for which he was famous. Thank you, Bobby, for all the light, laughter, intelligence, insight, and love you brought into the world. He was so sweet and hilarious and wonderful to work with. I remember him as just the loveliest guy with such a great sense of humor. Bobby was the genuine article. I always thought of him as a true man of New York. <laughs> I will always treasure our times together at Child. He truly was one of the good ones. I have the best memories of Bobby, and everyone is embraced in hysterical laughter. He was a light in our lives, had the quickest wit, and brought fun to everything. I remember Bobby and his wry sense of humor so fondly, he made us all laugh, but was also the sharpest copywriter and a dear friend. We are so lucky to have known him. That sweet face and mellow demeanor made his dead-on singers even more hysterical. <laughs> Bobby was a pure joy to work with and a true gift of a human being. I feel so lucky to have known him. My heart is broken. I have such fond memories of hilarious and brilliant Bobby. What a remarkable soul. Bobby was one of a kind. And, oh, the conversations he and I had in my offices. <laughs> he listened closely and without judgment, gave sound advice, and told the best stories. I can still hear him imitate his Uncle Andre from France. <laughs> <laughs> he made me laugh, yes, but it was the soft core and kindness underneath that made me love him. Outside the workplace, Bobby was, if possible, even more wonderful. He came to dinner in my Park Slope apartment shortly after I got married and walked in with Bruce carrying freshly planted herbs. They visited soon after my son Truman was born and fussed over him. When we bought a house in Westchester, Bobby took the train to our town and spent a day advising me on the garden, accompanying me to the nursery, and helping me plant. He taught me about hostas and not the variegated ones. <laughs> <laughs> a large round terracotta planter he gave me as a gift and the rectangular one, the healthy herbs, have sat on my front steps every year since. When Truman turned three, I threw a beastly feast birthday party centered on Bruce's first children's book. The mosquitoes brought burritos, <laughs> the parents brought carrots, the author read the book to the children, and Bobby was there too, good-naturedly wisecracking the entire time. <laughs> When Bobby and I no longer worked together, Truman and I met him for lunch at coffee shops in the city. I treasured these memories and many more. Bobby adored Bruce. Their relationship was and is a marvel to me. It grounded him in his life and gave him so much strength and joy. My heart breaks for him for the Finch and Goldstone families and his many friends. I am grateful to have known Bobby, to have listened to him, laughed with him, and loved him. I always will. And Gary and Steve are up next. just to explain what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> so Bobby did write all of this ephemera. I, think, I just realized listening to Andrea that, you know, if one reads the collected letters of George Bernard Shaw, and I've been waiting, I, somebody must have published their collected emails by now. <laughs> but it really would be wonderful to have the collected flags of Bobby Kelly, <laughs> because they were useful, but they were hysterical. He wrote a great flag. Um, he also wrote really good, when he when it was downtime, he wrote very funny things that he said when <coughs> we lost all of them, or most of them. Um, he wrote at Child Magazine a memo that was a record of his day, and I've asked uh, Gary and Stephen to read the memo. <laughs> oh, this is at Clover. 
Clover Archer. Your Clover isn't here, is she? I don't, yeah. So she found this and sent it to me just recently, and I had never heard of it. <laughs> From Robert Kelly. Sent Monday, March 8, 2004. Subject, my day. 9.30, arrived, settled in. 9.45, checked office email. 9.50, checked home email. 9.55, went to CNN for latest news. 10 o'clock, cigarette. 10.10, .10, helped Polly with wall. 10.30, rested from wall. 10.40, went to eBay, searched for vintage end table. 10.55, switched search to retro end table. 11.05, cigarette. 11.15. Widened original search to vintage table, many entries. 11.35. <laughs> Widened other search to retro table, also many entries. 12.05. Cigarette. 12.15. Debated calling a friend. Too tired. <laughs> 12.20. Stared. 12.25. Went online to Data Lounge, a celebrity gossip board. 12.45. Went out to lunch. 1 o'clock. Brought back lunch. Rested from trip. <laughs> One fifteen. Eight. One thirty. Cigarette. One forty. Checked home email to see if anything new since morning. One fifty. Copy edited the child challenge. Read twice to really nail it. <laughs> Two thirty. Cigarette. Two forty. Did second pass copy edit of what I wish. Resentful at being swamped. <laughs> Three o'clock. Check data lounge to see if anything new since morning. 310. Check CNN to see if anything new since morning. 310. Met with Polly to go over status. 335. Rested from status meeting. <laughs> 340. Cigarette. 350. Discovered I hadn't enclosed red folder when I passed child challenge on to Andrea. 352. Went to Andrea's office with red folder. Door closed. 353. Thought about slipping red folder under door. Decided against. 354. Pouted about St. Adria's door being closed. <laughs> 4 o'clock. Cigarette. 410. Began to wind down from week. <laughs> 415. Decided to chance trying to give red folder to Andrea again. Lucky, door open. 416. Discovered Andrea already had a red folder to her story. Very confused. <laughs> 417. Rested from confusing episodes. 425. Returned to winding down. 430. Listened to funny story from Clover. 435. Got peanuts from vending machine. 440. Got water from cooler. Thirsty from peanuts. 450. Holly left. 451. Bobby left. They were terrifying. He talked his parents over and over into going with his best friend, Norman Bartke, to, there were two or three, or at least two matinee places that would show monster movies. And every week he would go see the monster that challenged the world, go home, and have terrible nightmares, wake up his parents, and they would say, no, you cannot go anymore. And he would <laughs> talk them into it, and week after week, and he loved it and was terrified by it. But it shows how real they were to him. They were real experiences. As he got older, moved to the city, he loved the early retrospective cinema village. Um, he, I remember he, uh, Tuesday Weld retrospective was very important to him. <laughs> one of the first that he had seen. And I remember him saying that he was literally bouncing out of his seat when he saw the lullaby of Broadway sequence of Gold Diggers of 1935. Now he was, as we've heard, a copy editor. He did not use the word literally incorrectly. <laughs> he was bouncing. It, and it's a very exciting sequence. If you, um, 
Yeah, I think that's 20 minutes long. It's a long sequence, worth checking out if you want. It's killer tap dance, <coughs> marvelous choreography. Um, and he was a really good mimic. He did do wonderful imitations, um, not on cue. Again, you couldn't ask him to do these things, but it, when they slipped out, they were great. He did, yeah, he did do them, Captain Pepper. Um, I put together a montage of clips of movies that he loved and movies that he quoted, because he did just verbal up in context these lines, and you would hear them again and again. Um, so one of, the thing, one of the lines that he loved to say, and it was often if he were serving, I ever made a chicken dinner, he would say, chicken please, ask Audrey Hepburn. I don't believe that. <laughs> um, which he told me was from Two for the Road, when she's on an airplane and she's speaking to a stewardess. So I went, when I was looking for clips, and I was looking for Two for the Road, found the stewardess scene. She does not speak in the stewardess scene. <laughs> so then I started realizing, okay, it must have been Audrey Hepburn. Started going through. <laughs> Turns out it's actually charade. Mm -hmm. And she's talking to Walter Matthau. And in the scene, uh, she's finding out information about her uh, dead husband that he's been a and she's surprised, and she'd initially turned down a sandwich, and then she wants one after Walter Matthau says something frightening. And she says, can I have a sandwich, please? He says, chicken or liverwurst? And she says, chicken. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> there is no quote, chicken, please. <laughs> we have spent so much of our life saying chicken, please. <laughs> And the line doesn't exist, as many things Bobby improved it. Um, so I, th that is, the, in fact, the name of this montage is Chicken Please, because it only exists in Bobby. Um, things to look for. There's a line that he quoted that isn't a quote. You will see at some point Arnold staying, and he loved to, it. If you saw, if I saw someone hot down the street, he'd say, well, there's no Arnold staying. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where he shows up because no one on earth has ever looked more like Arnold staying than Arnold staying. <laughs> you will recognize him. Um, the other thing to just listen for, as I was putting it together, I realized, and sort of knew it, but it became very clear, that he loved soundtracks. He was very drawn. And I remembered that in the early days, um, dating ourselves to technology, he, <laughs> set the cassette recorder up. This is, we didn't have VHS. They existed then, but we didn't have one. He set the microphone up and recorded the entire movie of Hunchback of Notre Dame for me to listen to. <laughs> because it was playing. So I had that, and he loved that. Um, the last, the film ends with a short black screen, which is Rebecca, because he never saw Rebecca. I was right. I told you. <laughs> he had he had seen so much of Hollywood, and he really did see everything, that at some point he kind of realized that the only classic film he hadn't seen was Rebecca. And he realized this pretty early. This was, I think he realized it before he met me. So this is how extensive his viewing was. And he wouldn't see it. He decided that if he ever saw Rebecca, he was going to die. <laughs> so he would not watch <laughs> Rebecca. And so there is, I rewatched it during COVID when he was without him, because I knew he was not on it. And it did, it turned out, with, with non intentionally, there is a dog named Jasper in Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And we didn't name our dog Jasper for that reason. But so he lived with part of Rebecca. Um, so that I, I know he would have loved it. It is a fine film, <laughs> but it is about the only one he didn't see. It's going to take a little bit of a minute for me to get the tech working and the lights out. Um, carry on. I've been friends with Bobby for, I don't know, 30 plus, close to 35 years. And I went through last night, I was going through like 15 years of emails looking for like funny things um, and of course I was you know laughing and crying as I went through them but what I really I mean as we all know as everybody said his wit was exceptional and surprising and original but what really shone 
through for me, uh, going through these emails, was this warmth and kindness and love, and how much I always felt loved by him, and how grateful I always would be for that gift. It just felt, it, I felt it from him all the time. He was a guru to me in a lot of ways. You know, I could email him like, what is this bird? How do I do that embroidery stitch? We got a new dog, what the fuck are we doing with this dog? Um, <laughs> there was one time, Bobby and Bruce, as people probably know, had or had this collection of lobby cards through their apartment that they would alternate out, right? So um, when my first year anniversary was coming up with my husband, which was paper, uh, he and I had a joke about a very famous Elvis movie called Clam Bake. And a movie, I'm kidding, nobody knows. And Bobby helped me track down pre-Google a lobby card dealer who had a set, a complete set of the lobby cards from Clambake <laughs> that I was able to acquire. I mean, he just seemed to know all these things. Um, also looking through the, I'm just jumping around, but also looking through the emails, I saw how he brought out my crassest self. Things I probably would not email or say with anybody but him and probably Mike Top. Um, going through all those emails, I think about 10% of them were um, Bobby and Mike and me trying to make plans to eat at tracks, which became our place, strangely. Um, but there was one thing, oh, one other thing I was gonna say, like I was getting dressed there, I was thinking, what would Bobby want me to wear? And all I could think of was he wanted me to wear eyeliner, like. Ronnie Spector. Maybe not a good idea. But I also wanted to read. I wanted to read this one little clip. Bruce, who said it with love, obviously, and actually their romance to me is like one of the great love stories. How much they loved each other. I remember Bobby saying like how much it still meant to him 30 years in to make Bruce laugh, and how much they still like to cuddle on the couch and watch TV together. <laughs> but this is an email in response to. Um, I think trying to make plans, and Mike might have been on this email too. He said, I'll have to check with Bruce. Friday's the day of that dreary fucking stupid ass party Bruce insisted on having that nobody wants to come to, least of all me. <laughs> He'll probably make me stay home to help clean and all that shit so that place is not too disgusting for the few losers who force themselves to show up. <laughs> Should be fun, you guys fine? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jackie Malloy, and um, Bobby was one of my first friends in New York City because I moved here uh, in 1984 and lived with Bruce and Amy, who's here, and Bruce started work at CCI, and when he got together, with Bobby, um, Andy and I got to meet him, and he immediately sort of opened up our world and it made life more fun. Um, and um, there were a lot of people from Hamilton, a lot are here today, um, which is where Bruce and I went to college. And Bobby was our honorary Hamiltonian, and he put up with listening to a lot of our stories and a lot of our talk about theater and a lot of our dreams. And he was very <coughs> indulgent and um, a little uh, amused, I think. But he um, he seemed, even though he was 15 years older than us, he seemed younger. And he looked younger <laughs> than a lot of us at the time. Um, and um, we, in turn, enjoyed his stories. Like, even this, this animal-loving man, apparently in the 60s, wore a fur belt or vest, <laughs> which <laughs> cracks me up to think about. And he would talk about his French mother and how she would confuse the word uh, kitchen with chicken, so she would go <laughs> cook in the chicken. Um, but a lot of my memories are from 
long, long time ago because I uh, moved 25 years ago to Las Vegas and it was always uh, a great honor when Bobby would come out to see me. But I wanna backtrack a second and say that um, uh, in my 20s, but when my life was chaotic, Bobby would always say, oh no, that's, that's how your 20s are supposed to be. Just you know, keep going in that chaotic direction. Um, and uh, when I finally settled down and married John Blau, um, uh, he and Bruce were great friends to us both. And then when John got sick, um, they were both enormously supportive. And I have um, drawings uh, of both Bruce and Bobby that John drew in the hospital. And I have uh, pictures that Bobby drew, drew for John. And um, I treasure those and I can never thank um, them enough um, for uh, the love they show both of us at that time. And then I was lucky that um, even after I moved, I would come back to New York every so often, and I always felt very honored when he would come out. And um, anyway, as Stona said, um, I wish I could remember like Ron did all the, the great lines that uh, Bobby had, but instead I remember the way he made me feel, and um, he, um, I, he made you feel like you were in on the joke about people and things, even if you couldn't make the joke yourself. <laughs> and he made you feel warmth and delight and love. And so I'm glad that I get to express my love to him. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about sharing, but my angle's a little different, so I thought I would share. Um, and it's, hearing this has just been fantastic. Um, love and sarcasm make a great combination, and it's obvious that with Bobby, that's what you all shared so much, it's fantastic. My connection is from Bruce, we did summer stock together in the mid 80s. And so I've known Bobby for a long time, but not as intimately as all of you, but known him and loved him for a long time. We had one joke, We've shared it endlessly. I posted it on the memorial thing. Um, so at early 85, we met and saw Bobby just intermittently. Not a lot of times in there. Bruce and I were good friends from the get-go, but became very close friends much later on. Not much, but later on. So Bobby and I didn't see each other real lot. So it's the early 90s, they came for our wedding. So Bruce and I were in the young company at this theater up in New Hampshire. Uh, we did the children's theater, which of course means we did not get paid. <laughs> and we were up there acting that, and the head of the nailing company was Austin. My name is Scott. Bobby sits at our whole wedding, my wife at my wedding, comes, watches the whole wedding, comes through the whole procession line and comes up and says, congratulations, Austin, <laughs> <laughs> after I got married. And I like, Bobby, I know we haven't seen each other a ton, but did you see me today? <laughs> did you catch me up there? But we got a lot of mileage out of it. And, and through the years, we just like, you know, shared. And when you talked about what Bobby made you feel, for me, a lot of times, it was Bruce and I, or amongst a lot of other things, were opera buddies. And so we'd come in, and I'd stay on the couch after the opera, and we'd be up there, and Bobby just made me feel so, so comfortable. It was one of the most beautiful smiles I've ever seen in my life. And I just always felt comfortable around Bobby. And I will miss him just the way so many of you who knew him so much closer. So I, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming. Um, I, I do want to, if anything that you think, I, I, the, the memorial site is ongoing. If you find more memos, if you feel like adding, contributing more stuff to that, people are still adding all the time and we're finding more things. So keep that going. I'll put the link to the movie up there. Um, 
and we have the room for a little bit, and then we're going to carry on with some actual food and beverages back home. Um, if you don't know the address, just ask me and I'll tell you where to go. <laughs> um, I'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone.